Hey guys, what's up? Public here back with another video. And today we're talking about how you push keys as a shadow priest. Now, some of this advice is going to be shadow priest specific in terms of, you know, various bits of utility or talents, things you can do as a shadow priest. But a lot of this is actually quite generic and that it, I think it apply to quite a lot of people looking to get into keys. Um, and I think some of this comes from the pug mentality that I think a lot of people go into this kind of setting themselves up for failure. And I want to try to help more people have success in this environment because I think it's a lot of fun once you get into it. Um, but I think a lot of this can be kind of tricky for folks, particularly right now when Shadow Priest isn't a meta spec. So and it can be really hard to kind of feel like you're on the back foot just trying to get into groups. And then once you're actually into a key, it can also be harder if you're not doing the things ahead of time to prep and make sure you're setting yourself up to not only time keys, but push them effectively with a group and have fun doing it. So let's dive in. Okay, so the first thing let's talk about is getting into keys. So first and foremost, you know, if you're not aware, having a, a solid group of people to do keys with is almost always going to be more enjoyable and generally speaking, more successful as long as you found people that have a like mindset as far as your goals for the season um, and as well as like similar skill levels. If you can match that and find a group of people, that's going to be your best bet. You know, playing some time out on the weekends or whatever it is to play with them. And that's when you're going to get the best results in your keys. Now, I know a lot of you guys don't have access to that. Um, it can be especially tricky if you're just starting the game as well. Or if you don't have like a guild that you're raiding with. And you can kind of use those people that you play with at that kind of similar raid level to do similar things inside of keys. Um, it's also kind of difficult because skill sets can be a little different. Although I think generally speaking, if you're successful at a high end in one, you can be successful at the high end of other. Not all of the skills are directly transferable. Um, so not always guaranteed to find success there. So what that leads a lot of people down the road to is pugging keys. And, you know, I think there's some generic advice out there where like obviously pugging can be horrible. People tell you to list your own key. Um, I think a lot of people, you know, for better or worse, don't like listing their own key, which is fine. But I think as soon as you start listing your own keys, it becomes immediately obvious why it's such a hard thing to get into keys. And I think a lot of people, you know, will joke that they spend more time signing up for keys than they do actually inside of dungeons. And if that's you, hopefully I can help you out a little bit. So just for some context, when you're signing up for keys as a DPS player, there are, you know, dozens and dozens of other people also signing up. So it's, it's a struggle when, especially in the current season, if you're not a meta spec, it's going to be hard to get into a key if you're not doing something to stand out. And typically what this means is your IO score is really high, your item level is really high. Maybe people will look at how many mythic bosses you've cleared, that kind of thing. And you're being somewhat unfairly judged, and it's just kind of the nature of things, between all of these other people, um, you know, and dozens, dozens of other DPS. Some of them are meta specs. So... And the group leader is going to pick whoever they think is going to help them the best to time that key. Since there is obviously a punishment if you don't time the key. So really what you want to do is you want to bring more to the group than just you as a DPS player. If you're just sitting in LFG and you just keep clicking sign up over and over and over again, and you're not seeing results, that's not going to get you anywhere. Like you maybe get lucky every once in a while, but you want to do something to, to kind of highlight yourself as a player whether that's bringing battle res and then putting that in your note, like, hey, I've crafted the engineering wrists, so even though I'm a priest, I don't ring battle res, you can invite me, I still bring this piece of utility to the group. Um, along the same lines, not everyone knows what a shadow priest brings to the key, so you can also, in your note, if it's incorporeal weeks or there's some affix that you can counter, like bursting, even though master spell got nerfed, put that in your note, be like, hey, I will handle incorporeal affix. I, I got it covered. I got it on lock. I can do it all myself, or I can, I bring this utility to help counter something in this key um, that makes the key much easier or mind soothes, things like that. And if you put that in your note, I know it's kind of not every group leader will read those, but it does stand out in the, in the group finder. It's like, Oh, let me look at this shadow priest. Oh, he has a note. What does the note say? Oh, look, he's going to help us counter this incorporeal affix. Oh, and he brings power infusion. I forgot that shadow priests have that. So don't always assume that everyone knows exactly what your spec can do. Um, and in this case, it also means you have to know what that is ahead of time. So you kind of want to know and mention how you can counter various things in the key or the affix in your note. If you can't fit in the note, you can always DM the group leader as well and just be like, hey, happy to get in voice to talk about things during the key. I'm, you know, I can bring this to the key, you know, whatever that may be for that particular dungeon and affix week. And 
ultimately your goal when pugging keys should be to stop pugging keys. Um, and what I mean by that is you want to get to a point where you meet and, and group up with other players. That way you don't have to ever pug again. So once you get your door, your foot in the door, so to speak, and you've getting, got into your first key, if it goes well, which hopefully it does, if, if everything was prepped okay, you want to make friends with those people so you can group up with them later. Whether it's immediately after that key, you know, offer up, hey, I have this key that we can do next. Or be like, hey, just send them friend advice after the fact. You are so much more likely to get into groups with your friends. And, and it's just people you've played with in the past. So this can be kind of as simple as once they see, you know, you're on your friends list and maybe they've listed another key in the future and they see that you've signed up and like, oh, hey, I've played with that guy before. We did really well together. Let's invite him again. Um, that can be that can do really well as well as if you really click with the people that you're playing with, especially if you join in voice, which I think is a, a, a definitely something to try, especially if you're, if you're trying to push keys, you want to be in voice. Um, if you get to know these folks, you know, message them on Discord, like, hey, are you going to do any more keys tomorrow or next weekend or something like that? And try to like schedule your own groups around that. Because as soon as you can find that core group of players, you can eliminate the time spent signing up for pugs. That's going to be your best bet for trying to push keys as a Shadow Priest. Okay, so now that we've talked about getting into dungeons, let's kind of talk about the next step, which is what is actually a push key? <laughs> uh, this gets thrown around a lot or like pushing quote unquote high keys. I wanted to kind of demystify this a little bit. This is super relative to you and your group. Push keys is, is just kind of another word or phrase, in my opinion, for progression or progression keys. And that is highly relative to you and your group. So the advice that I'm kind of giving out is going from that kind of prog mentality and that cutoff basically being, hey, we're easily three chesting this key to, oh, we're barely timing this key as that kind of delineation between a push key or just a normal like quote unquote farm key or something else like that, or like a weekly key. And I think this in, this delineation is important because that threshold is gonna be different for every single player. If you're just starting out in the season, you're playing with your friends, again, if you're of like-minded, maybe you know timing everything on a plus 20 is your push. Um, and that's the kind of hard content for you. And that's totally acceptable. If you're, you know, a full mythic raider and you're getting like, I'm doing 25s and we're going up to 27, 28, even up to 30, whatever it is, it's all relative to your group. So I just want to keep that in mind. You don't need to be the top 1% to consider, you know, pushing keys. I think for you, that's relative and you can take this advice and apply it to at any level at that point. So talking about how to push keys and some advice when it comes to that, your first thing that you want to, you're going to have to consider is how you're going to live dungeons. Once you're at this like push key threshold based on your item level, whatever that is, you're going to hit a point where stuff starts hitting really hard. And some of this stuff is avoidable, which you should absolutely learn how those mechanics work and dodge them. Other bits are not avoidable. It's just like group wide damage that just happens, or maybe you get targeted by a mechanic, something like that. And you're going to have to figure out how to use your defensives to live dungeons. For a lot of people, I think in, in a raid especially, it can be easy to be like, oh, the raid leader's calling for my defensive here. Well, in a mythic plus dungeon, you don't got a raid leader doing that, or you, you probably don't. So you're going to have to know when mechanics are happening before that they're going to happen, either with big wigs or, or little wigs in that case, deadly boss mod, something like that to indicate, hey, there's a mechanic coming in. There's also plenty of weak auras that I'll have in the description that help tell you like, hey, mobs are targeting you with an ability, get ready for it. And these kinds of things can all help you plan out when to use your defensives. And especially as a Shadow Priest, we have a wide array of defensives. Now, some of them less good than others, <laughs> but we do have things like Fade, Desperate Prayer. You can even flash heal yourself for this tiny amount of DR that that has. We also have Dispersion. Even Power Word Shield can be counted as like a small defensive. So for things like that, when you're getting to this threshold, you need to figure out how to live dungeons. And good defensive usage is the top of your list of how to do that. Now, we also have bigger spells like Dispersion that can really help for like big group AoE. I think the best example of this is in Black Rook Hold. Both the first boss and the last boss have pretty big wide AoE group abilities. You need to know when those are coming to use Dispersion. <laughs> um, and the other option that you have is to check out your items here. You can also itemize to help you live dungeons better. So not only can you kind of work in versatility a little bit more, which we'll talk about that kind of in a Shadow Priest specific environment, you can also gear your character with different items that help you live dungeons more. A lot of guides, including the guides that I put out, are generally focused around squeezing out as much damage as you possibly can 
um, with your character. But when you get into high Mythic Plus push keys, living becomes just as valuable, if not more valuable, and then dealing enough damage. Because you can't deal damage if you're dead, and battle reses are a finite resource. So some options to consider here when you get to this push key level. Try out Undulating Spore Cloak or Choker of Shielding. These are both um, bad offensively. <laughs> they're, they're almost not recommended, I think, by anyone from a pure offensive perspective. In fact, Choker of Shielding is actually a DPS loss uh, when you use it. But if they save your life, it's worth it. So this is something, as we get into the later weeks of the season and you have like spare sparks, I would definitely consider crafting one or both of these. They do count as embellishments. So you, if you're using something like, you know, Blue Silken Lining, Hood of Surging Time... The, the allied risk guards, that kind of thing. You can't use all of these things together. But at some point in the key, it might you might hit a point where, hey, I'm going to sacrifice the 1% damage that most of these embellishments are giving me so that I can potentially live a mechanic that I wouldn't otherwise. I think Choker of Shielding is particularly kind of slept on. I think it's pretty pretty great. It's an on-use shield that you can use um, to help you live like really hard-hitting abilities. Um, so this is something you should definitely consider. Make sure you're using your defenses often. Now, moving on from that, the other kind of thing you want to think about is how else can you build out your character to help reduce incoming damage, but also try to push your character's limits a little bit. One thing to consider that I feel like not a whole lot of people know about is alchemy is actually somewhat underrated here in, com in terms of the value that it brings. So a lot of people suggest to run Verse Flask, which I think is a great idea if you're trying to reduce incoming damage. But one thing, if you're trying to kind of skirt this line of like, living a key versus doing enough damage to time the key you really want to be strongly considering being an alchemist specific specifically with the decayology spec this actually reduces the downsides that you take from certain things like the um, toxic healing potion um, or even the crit flask that does damage you if you um, take enough damage that kind of thing if you're using especially crit flask and you're trying to push damage or you want to use the toxic health potion which is you know, miles better, I think, than the Dreaming Health Potion that we're using in this patch. You know, being an alchemist severely reduces the downsides with that spec and can be something that could help you live something you wouldn't otherwise without having all those adverse negative effects. So definitely something to consider. Um, okay, moving on. Something else that I think not very many people are involved with at a DPS level, and it's severely going to hold you back, is not knowing the route ahead of time. So I think a lot of people somewhat unfairly put this burden on the tank in the, in their keys, which it can be easy. Obviously the tank is the one that's usually pulling things, but as a DPS player, if you want to maximize your damage inside of a key push key or not, actually you need to know the route ahead of time. Specifically, you need to know, Hey, what are we pulling when what's up next? And when is the boss coming? Now, these are questions you, you can and should ask ahead of time, but don't be afraid to also ask this in the middle of the key. This is why voices particularly critical. Sometimes in the key, some people don't like the pre-planned routes, which is fine, or they have a generic idea of the route that they want to run. If you're inside of voice, you should be constantly communicating with your tank and your group members of like the status of your cooldowns and what abilities that you have. The, the goal here is when the group has cooldowns, you want to pull mobs around those cooldowns. Maybe do pulls that you wouldn't do otherwise. Similarly, if the boss is coming up in a minute or something, but you still have two minutes left on your cooldowns, that can be something you can communicate with your group. Like, hey, can we do like one small trash pack to make sure that I have all of my cooldowns up and available uh, for the lust timer or something else like that? And doing this correctly versus not doing it all is a monster and a monster difference when it comes to damage. At like almost double if you do this correctly. So if you're really struggling with damage, it's likely because you're kind of YOLOing this. And what's going to happen a lot of times is you might use your cooldowns and, you know, the pack just dies instantly and it was kind of a waste. And then you're having to walk out to the other side of the, the dungeon for the next pull and you can't chain effectively. Or maybe you messed up and it's a tyrannical week and you suddenly don't have your cooldowns for when you're about to pull a boss and you're lusting the start of the boss and you just have no cooldowns for that. These kinds of differences can make up a massive amounts of damage and really hurts you when it comes to timing the key. So you really want to put in the effort, even if it's a pug key, like, Hey guys, is there a route we're using for this key ahead of time? Um, if it's not a pug key, go over the route in, in voice ahead of time, especially if it's a push key to know exactly what you're doing when, 
And then mid-dungeon, make sure you're asking questions and you know what's coming next. That way you can plan your cooldowns effectively. The way that we do the most damage is by using our cooldowns as much as possible, but making sure that you have them for the big important times and windows in the dungeon. Now, I can't tell you, I can't give you a script of like, okay, in this dungeon, this affix, use your cooldowns here. It's going to be somewhat group dependent. As the season goes on, people start to use the same routes over and over and over again. So it will become more homogenized, but it is something you want to be fluid on and flexible, especially if you find yourself pugging keys more often than not. So last thing, a bit of generic advice this season specifically, if you're trying to push keys is think about your racial abilities. So this is something that is is almost always a thing inside of Mythic Plus, less so inside of Raid. I think this season in particular, there's quite a lot of mechanics that would benefit from you being a Night Elf and being able to Shadow Meld, um, or even Dwarf, to be honest, and having Stone Form, which is what I currently am. There's quite a lot of abilities this season that can be Stone Formed. I think there's probably a better use case to playing Night Elf. If you are considering pushing keys, again, talking about stuff that you can put in your note when you're signing up for a group, like, hey, I'm a Night Elf, I can get rid of a mechanic, <laughs> or just like if it, get, if it targets me, uh, I can Night Elf it away. Shadow Meld is in, insanely valuable for some of these keys, especially on like high Tyrannical Weeks. Uh, some of the Dawn of the Infinite bosses in particular can do some pretty cool stuff with Shadow Meld. Um, I'll actually link a week or in the description that does like a notification when you can Shadow Meld. I think it works for like Feign Death and Vanish as well, but as a priest, all we have is Shadow Meld if you're a Night Elf. So definitely something to consider to kind of help you give you that extra edge when it comes to utility. Um, luckily, I think Dwarf, a bit more than Night Elf, is actually also quite competitive from a DPS perspective. Night Elf is also pretty good as well. Um, so don't feel bad about like losing damage. But obviously this is like minor optimizations, but when you get into push keys, uh, some of this stuff can be a pretty big deal if you can afford to race change. So, all right, well, that's it for kind of generic advice. Let's finish off this video with Shadow Priest specific advice. Okay, finally, let's talk about your Shadow Priest. So first things first, as a Shadow Priest or anything, you really want to optimize your talent build for the key that you're doing. I think Shadow, maybe more so than some other specs, does have some options of things that you can move around inside of your build to suit that particular dungeon that you're doing. So this is, you know, to start off, Almost every single key will have some variation of the class talents to take in each key. Um, in the Ice Invades guide, I give you kind of like a drop down where you can say, I'm doing this dungeon with these affixes, and it spits out, you should have these utility points. So that's something to pull up on a second monitor before each key to make sure, yep, I have disease dispel for this key, or oh, I need mass dispel for this key, or maybe uh, shackle and dead for incorporeal weeks, that kind of stuff. So if you want that kind of cheat sheet, check out the guide below. Um, in addition to class talents, you also want to make sure that you have the right spec talents for the key that you're doing. You know, is it tyrannical? Are you pulling massive amounts of mobs uh, with the boss? You know, making sure that you have the right spec talents to handle what the key is asking for your group is really important. Um, one thing to also consider is saying, hey, if I'm if my the other two DPS in my group are big AOE blasters and they just do massive amounts of AOE damage, like you have two havoc demon hunters or something. That might be a case where it's saying, okay, my group actually has a lot of really good mass AoE. I might actually spec out of mass AoE, take the hit on overall damage, but actually go more into as like a single target build, like the single target Shadow Crash build, um, something like that, or making sure that I have like Mastermind instead of Screams of the Void, those kinds of things to make sure that you're optimizing the damage of the key where you need it. At a certain point, if everyone in your group is blowing every single cooldown at the same time, and you're all blasting AOE damage, and then it's tyrannical weak, well, bosses are taking up, you know, a significant portion of the key, if not the majority portion of the key. So you want to make sure that you're kind of optimizing your damage, not just within yourself, but how you fit into your group composition. This is particularly challenging with pug groups, which is why... I think it's really important to try to find a group of people to consistently run with because it gets easier to tune this the more you run with the same people and over over and over again because then you kind of get a sense of where their damage patterns are, which can be somewhat character specific or class spec specific, that kind of thing. So definitely something to consider. Kind of along those lines of sacrificing DPS, you, I would also kind of throw up two somewhat uncommon parts of Shadow's kit that I don't think are utilized very often by people. But when it comes to Mythic Plus environments, you're facing a timer. Sometimes the answer isn't always to do as much damage as you possibly can all the time. 
Um, although oftentimes I think that's the main one. Uh, two things to consider. One, inside of our spec tree, we do have access to psychic horror. Now, getting into this is almost certainly going to be a damage loss. Um, every point that you're adding in that top section is basically removing a flex point in the middle of our tree, which, you know, is roughly like 1% ish per point that we're doing that, which in the grand scheme of things, it does add up. But if you're talking about certain parts of our kit, sometimes your group really just needs an extra stun, uh, like psychic core. I think Everbloom has some good examples with those berserker mobs where you, it's actually a pretty good, uh, tech if you stun them while the ability is, is would be casted otherwise it won't get cast at all there are a lot of like small things like that where having a single target stun can be pretty valuable you just want to be very careful like when you're doing it you're taking a damage loss to do it so coordinate with your group when that choice makes sense um, similarly on the other side of the coin if you're playing with a protection paladin and your healer has a kick that might be a case where your group can afford for you to not take silence so that you could get more damage. So there's kind of this decision will swing based on what you're looking for in your group. You just want to be careful and make sure that you're making the best coordinated decision with your group so that you have the best success. Now, the other thing to consider is Shadow Priest does have access to hybrid abilities. So specifically off healing. I think this is more relevant on certain weeks than others and certain dungeons than others, but some dungeons just have pretty high healing requirements. Um, and sometimes this can also be difficult on your healer just because of how much damage is happening in like a short window. You know, if a healer has to keep casting, they only have so many GCDs. And sometimes that's a case of, is there something a shadow priest could offer that would make that easier? So some things to think about, I think the big one for, for folks to consider first is power word life. It's kind of an oh crap button where if you or someone else is falling into that like really low health threshold, just chucking out like even a handful of power word life throughout the key can actually make a massive difference, especially if it ends up saving someone's life. So certainly something to consider. Again, you maybe take a damage loss if you have to drop some mind games talents to get there. But if it ends up saving you or someone else's life, that can be pretty valuable. The other thing to think about, which is pretty underused, but I do think more and more people might consider this now that we have a bit more flexibility in our class tree with a few less points locked in every key, is taking things like Renew and or Prayer of Mending. I know this sounds kind of weird, not something that a lot of you have probably thought about, especially in like healing intensive weeks. A lot of you might find yourselves, especially for the indoor dungeons, you're running between pack to pack and you're just casting nothing. Maybe you're doing like feathers on the ground or you have body and soul, you're powered, shielding yourself to speed yourself up. While you're going pack to pack, you can just cast out renews on your member, on your team or prayer of mending on cooldown when you're out of combat. These kinds of things, it's just small bits of healing and it's effectively free for us. The mana is irrelevant, but what it can do is it can just give your healer an extra second or so to focus on damage themselves. Um, and the other kind of side benefit, although this is more rare, it does actually give you a chance of proccing Twist of Fate from healing your allies, which could actually be a damage increase. So those are some things from like a build perspective to consider doing in your Shadow Priest. Um, the other thing I would mention, I just recently released a talent video. So if you haven't seen that and you're kind of curious about which talent build to pick for which dungeon or like which specific scenario, that video in the Mythic Plus page on Icy Veins does a pretty good job of kind of explaining your options hopefully to help you make the best decision for, for you and your group. Um, now, the other thing to, to talk about with Shadow Priest that I vaguely mentioned before is knowing your Shadow Priest utility. We have actually quite a lot. <laughs> um, we saw this in Season 2 in particular when we just had so much that we could counter so much in these dungeons. The current dungeon pool is not quite as ludicrous when it comes to Shadow Priest utility or Priest utility, um, but we still do have quite a lot that I want to make sure that, you know, you know what you have in your toolkit inside these dungeons to make your group successful. Not only do we have things like Dispel and Mass Dispel, which are critically important. I know a lot of other classes like Demon Hunter or Mage have similar things. Mass is still quite unique and can be really helpful. Um... To, to use these the best, though, you want to make sure you have an add-on like Plater, Shadowed Unit Frames, things like this to know both when an enemy and a party member has something that you can get rid of with one of these abilities. Um, by default, for the most part, Plater does a pretty good job of this on enemy mobs. Just by default, you install the thing. It kind of highlights when a mob has something that's dispellable. 
Um, Shadow Unit Frames has a setting for this as well when you configure your buffs. Um, for your party members, it can also be like, oh, hey, this is like, it like highlights them as dispellable when they have them. And you can actually set it up to only show it when they're dispellable on both of those. There's plenty of extensions for, for Plater and that kind of thing as well, but I would definitely suggest make sure you have those as like a baseline just to easily see what's happening in your key. Among those things, you also have Purify Disease. Similar, you can use shadow unit frames to help kind of track when a party member has one of these things. I found it can be kind of difficult to pinpoint exactly how, when someone has a disease versus something else. I personally use an add-on called Decursive, which you might see like right below my weak auras. Um, it is a click-based thing, but for me, I don't know, it's nice. I like being able to see like it literally just lights up a box uh, with a color when they have a disease that I can purge off um, from an ally. Um, it's pretty helpful. I like using that, but do what it works best for you. Just make sure if there's diseases in the key, like dark heart or something else like that, you have it available to use. Something else to think about that I think is largely underused now. It was kind of a recent change, but psychic scream is low key. One of the best things that we have in our kit right now from a utility perspective, because it is an AOE interrupt basically. Now, not every mob in the game can be feared, which is why it makes this a little tricky. Um, there are some use cases like that. I think like undead mobs in particular. So you'll see this in like a tall Dazar, Black Rook Hold. Um, but outside of those examples, you can and should be using Psychic Scream as an AOE interrupt. And this should be something that you coordinate with your group. I think the best example I can think of in the current season in Black Rook Hold when you're and effectively those massive gauntlets with all those uh, I forget the, the little minion mobs in the hallway. Um, and you typically pull like eight of them at a time, even more. Sometimes, um, they do a cast where they drink a potion and they effectively transform and get some effect. A lot of groups layer crowd control and AOE stuns to delay that happening as often as possible. They might start off with a leg sweep and then go into an AOE blind from the rogue and whatever else that, you know, other members of your group have. You want to make sure that Psychic Extreme is a part of that. You have to play in melee to do this, but it is something you should coordinate with your group, and you can even talent into reduced Psychic Extreme cooldown. You're not really doing it for the fear. You're doing it as if it's an AoE interrupt, and that's how you kind of want to picture the spell. It's something used well can be imperatively valuable for your group, so if you're not doing that already, make sure you uh, start looking into that. And that's pretty critical to understanding you know, the dungeon and the route to make sure, oh yeah, this is a good spot for that. Um, other things to mention, Shackle Undead and Dominate Mind. These are kind of more niche abilities, although those two in particular directly counter Incorporeal as the Aphex, and you can solo this Aphex as a Shadow Priest because you can Dominate Mind one and Shackle the other one, and you can solo it if you need to, um, although it is generally safer if you get one, someone else gets another just for safety purposes, but it is technically possible with our levels of haste to get both. Um, there is some niche use cases for Dominate Mind in certain dungeons. I actually have a list in the Icy Veins guide of all the ones that I've kind of come into uh, recently with like good abilities, that kind of thing that mobs might have. Shackle and Dead, definitely more niche. There are dungeons, like I mentioned before, like Atal Dazar and Block Rook, which do have undead enemies, which if you're trying to kind of move things around or CC, it can be helpful depending on your group's route, um, although not as used, you know, as, as usual these days. Now, uh, another kind of uncommon thing I want to mention with both of those abilities, you can also use these to help counter bolstering. So, take an example, you pulled this pack, you accidentally pulled more than you meant to, um, and maybe that pull has like a really small mob, like the dogs in Waycrest, or something else like that, that have like half the HP pool of the other mobs that are really important that you don't want to bolster. You can use things like Shackle and Dead and Dominate Mide before they get bolstering stacks to crowd control those little small mobs. And then you kind of hold on to them until the health pool would have matched. And then you can release them to hopefully kill them all evenly. Um, so that can be something you can do to kind of help counter bolstering. Definitely something to consider. Um, and then the last thing to consider from a kind of utility perspective as a shadow priest, again, this is a pretty uncommon one and it's quite specific is void shift. So a lot of folks, including myself, like to default to Essence Devourer, which is just your bender does healing when it melees, which is good for just passive dungeon healing. But you could also consider on particularly hard, I think challenging tyrannical weeks, Void Shift could actually be a pretty 
niche ability that can help an ally get out of a sticky situation. Somewhat similar to like the power word life use case. So Waycrest Manor, I think, is a good one where, you know, Thorns is cast on someone um, or Jagged Nettles from the from the Triad boss. These kind of like big single target nuke abilities. A lot of them are, you know, easily telegraphed as well. So if you're paying close attention during those, usually there's not group damage going out and you can kind of use this to help get an ally out of a bad situation or even yourself. Just be careful who you, who you use it on. So yeah, this is just some utility you want to keep in mind in all of your keys to making sure you're offering the group as much as you possibly can. Okay, the next thing to talk about is gearing. So this is kind of a, a light one. I know I already mentioned earlier, you should consider like having engineering bracers to give that extra bit of utility for your group. Um, other things I wanted to mention, just from like a gearing perspective, you want to treat this a little separately from raid. Oftentimes the, the suggestions for like top trinkets or you know top things like that inside of a raid environment aren't necessarily the same inside of a dungeon because obviously the, the pattern of damage is quite different. So if you're this, if you're someone that's crafted, you know, particularly like single target embellishments or crafted items, or um, using trinkets like Naimus, that is particularly like a single target burst trinket, that's not going to be giving you the best results inside of Mythic Plus. So you you kind of need to optimize your gearing and make sure you're using you know proper trinkets that work well in Mythic Plus. Um, now you can obviously change this up if you're trying to optimize for tyrannical versus fortified i have a kind of a rough list of all of the trinkets from this season and kind of their relative placing on like a tier list you can use you'd also sim your character in aoe fight types or dungeon route fight types that kind of thing um just to kind of see like hey what trinkets make sense for this you could also just experiment i think a lot of people are relying pretty heavily on sims these days try stuff out you know mess around with different builds and different trinkets just to see what makes sense for your character um, one thing I would consider that I, I do mention in the guide, but I feel like not a whole lot of people are catching on to it yet, mostly because we're still kind of gearing up and, you know, getting sparks can be tricky, is Hood of Surging Time. So this is somewhat of a slept on gear item, I think. It is kind of awkward to use because it is in the helm tier, which is ideally one of our better tier pieces. But for the sake of running this helm, it is worth it in Mythic Plus to drop that tier piece there and use uh, tier chest instead, or all the other slots instead. It basically gives you a mini power infusion to start off every single pack inside of Mythic Plus. Um, this benefit is just really fun. It's fun to play with, and it's really powerful as well. So I would definitely suggest consider crafting that if you haven't already. Um, as far as other embellishment items, you know, I, I'm currently kind of, depending on my group and my comp, I'll use either the NG Res Bracers or I will use um, the Risk Guards of Time Dilation just to give that better group benefit. Um, some kind of honorable mentions. Obviously, you can use things like Spore Cloak or the Choker of Shielding if you need that from your embellishments from like a defensive aspect. If you don't need defensives and you're using NG Res Bracers and you're like, okay, well, what are my other options? At that point, you, I would just use Blue Silk and Lining um, as my default. You can use Elemental Lariat if you really prefer, but I think BSL is your best bet in terms of uh, dungeon throughput. Um, and then the last thing, I did loosely mention this before. From a stat priority perspective, as a Shadow Priest, especially like towards the end of your gearing, you should have a pretty set amount of haste in that kind of 30 to 35% range. Your mastery is going to be like 19 to 21%. Once you hit that, this is when a lot of people are hitting this like, my sins are telling me to do weird stuff with crit and verse, um, which is quite normal uh, once we hit those first DR thresholds. I will say in general in Mythic Plus, I would lean a bit heavier on the haste than you would so in raid. Haste just scales really well um, as we add targets, um, and it also just kind of helps cover up mistakes more. So I would definitely maybe on the higher end of, of haste in that scale. Um, but after that, a lot of people... And my advice generally is, you know, haste equal to mastery, then go crit, then go verse. While that advice is true from like a throughput perspective, I do want to highlight that the difference between critical strike and verse is quite small. And because of that, I would strongly suggest maybe leaning towards the versatility end of things if you have a choice, either from gems or enchants after you've got your haste and mastery covered. Instead of leaning into crit, consider leaning into verse just from a survivability perspective. And the same thing goes for trinkets. I don't know if we'll get to this point of we're going to be using tank trinkets to live things in Mythic Plus. Probably not. Um, there's also some some memes with PvP trinkets to get out of different CCs, which that might be a thing to use. Um, but there are trinkets like Sea Star that do, do just have base versatility on them, which can just help prop up your character defensively. 
So these are all things you should consider when it comes to gearing, just to help live things and make sure that you're optimizing your gear as well as your, your talents. So now the last thing, the last piece of advice in this video is to understand power infusion. So this is kind of a, I know a lot of people just like they're sad about power infusion and they don't like talking about it. Um, but power infusion is one of the best pieces of utility that we have in our kit still because we can give it away and still get it ourselves. To get the best usage out of this, again, this is really hard inside of pugs. When you're inside of a coordinated group, you want to make sure that you're tracking your group members' cooldowns. I personally use uh, Method Raid Tools, I believe is what it is. Um, it has a, a raid cooldown section. You can actually have it so it's tracking everyone's major cooldown. You can kind of select what you want. You can even place it like on their frames if you'd like. Um, that way you know like, hey, my rogue is cooldown in here or my hunter is cooldown in here. And that can give you kind of a better idea of saying like, okay, who do I want to power infusion at this particular moment? Because if you're just, you know, hard coding this at the start of a pool and I'm, or the start of a dungeon into a macro, you might be misusing it from a group damage perspective. Um, it could also be something where it's just helpful to know when your group members are cooldowning. Maybe you save for the next pack. Um, it could also be a case of if you have your cooldowns ready, but your, your rogue or your warlock doesn't have it for another like 20 seconds. Well, maybe you hold a little bit. Uh, to, to match up to give them power infusion. So some of these things are, are, are just the ways that you can optimize your group's damage to make sure that you're using power infusion better as a Shadow Priest. Now, that is a lot of stuff. And I, I know this video went kind of long. Um, this is kind of just things that I've noticed, uh, both writing the guide, running my own keys, answering questions in the Discord. I'm sure I missed some stuff or I have different takes than other folks. So in the comments below, if you have experience pushing keys, as any class respect. I'm just curious, what are some things that you found that you've, uh, you know, little tips and tricks for pushing keys? Um, if you have if Shadow Priest specific or not, I'd love to hear what you guys have. And maybe we'll put that in the guide too for other folks to see. But anyways, thanks for watching. Appreciate all the support and the help. Um, and yeah, we'll see you in the next video.